Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I wanted to talk a little bit about the Salafis or the Salafiyya or the Wahhabis or Wahhabiyya or Ahlul Hadith. There's different names and titles to this group of people that came about a couple of hundred years ago. And I wanted to talk specifically about their claim to be followers of the Quran, Sunnah, and Salaf. And this is something you'll commonly hear them say that, Ya Akhi, we follow the Quran and the Sunnah upon the understanding of the Salaf al Salih, upon the understanding of the rightly guided generations after the Prophet. This is something you'll commonly hear them say. And because of that, I need to make it extremely clear before I say anything that we don't have a problem with following the Quran and the Sunnah and the Salaf uh, or upon the understanding of the Salaf al Salih. And in fact, every single Muslim who is an adherent to Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, right, should be following the Quran and Sunnah and Salaf. And this is something, you know, it's incumbent upon every single Muslim to do so. However, the problem is in the understanding of the statements of the Salaf, just as it is in the understanding of the Quran and Sunnah. What I mean by this is when they say we, and we say also, when we say that we follow the Quran and the Sunnah upon the understanding of the Salaf al Salih, it's because some verses of the Quran and some ahadith may have more than one meaning to them. So we take the, the, the rightly guided generation after the Prophet and his own generation and their understanding of those verses to understand them correctly uh, and to take one meaning over another meaning. Now, what happens when the Salaf make a statement that holds the possibility of more than one meaning? They can hold two meanings or three meanings. What happens when that's the case? Who do we go to to understand the statements of the Salaf such that we can say that we under that we are following in the footsteps of the Salaf al Salih? This is where the problem comes. Now. In order to answer this, I want to make um, a few points. The first point is the preservation of the Qur'an is the same way the hadith has been preserved and the same way that Islam as a whole has been preserved for, for over 1,400 years. That preservation of the Qur'an is mentioned in the Qur'an itself where Allah says, إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا الذِّكْرَ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظُونَ That we have revealed the book, Allah saying that He revealed the Qur'an and He takes it upon Himself to protect the Qur'an. Now what is the method by which Allah protected the Qur'an and preserved the Qur'an all this time? That same method is actually the same method by which uh, the hadith literature and the statements of the Prophet ﷺ have been preserved. And that exact same method is how the correct understanding of the statements of the Salaf al-Salih have been preserved. When the student sits with the teacher and says, I learned X, Y, and Z from my teacher. And I learned that from my teacher. And he learned it from his teacher all the way back to the, uh, the, the scholar that they're taking from. So, you know, the authors of different, you know, great books from the past, the Salaf al-Salih, the, even the Sahaba, you have the chains of narration, etc. And it goes, you know, essentially all back to the Prophet wasallam. So this method of preservation is how the Ummah and how Islam has been preserved. And one thing I'll say is that Allah says He'll protect and preserve the Qur'an. What use and benefit is there in protecting the wording of the Qur'an if the correct meaning of the Qur'an got lost? So if the meanings and the correct understanding of the Qur'an and Sunnah got lost, then the Qur'an itself has not been preserved. So that means that, the, that by this verse itself, that means that the correct understanding of the Qur'an and Sunnah will also be preserved. Now, the second point that I want to make is You'll always hear the Salafis when they try and, you know, bring their ideas and they try and back it up with scholars saying, look, this scholar from this generation said this and that scholar said that. They mention scholars, famously, they mention scholars of hadith, scholars who specialized in hadith, muhaddithin. Now, take this example before I clarify my point. When you go to university and you apply for a course in biology, you're taking a course in biology. Your professor is going to be someone who specialized in biology, isn't it? When you take a course in mathematics, your professor is going to be a mathematician, is it not? Right? You take the field from those who specialized in the field. You take knowledge of that field from those who specialized in the field. The same goes with Islamic sciences. When we're talking about, uh, you know, hadith and tafsir and fiqh, and there's different, you know, all the fields within Islamic sciences, we're going to take each field from those who are specialized in that field. So if we're talking about the grading of a hadith or you know the the ruling of a person or the biography of a person or uh, the, you know the life of such and such person, you'll take that from the muhaddith, no problem. If you're going to take the understanding of the Quran and Sunnah, take it from that person who specialized in the field. Now who is specialized in the field of understanding the Quran and Sunnah? That is the fuqaha. The fuqaha are the jurists and their job was to understand. It comes, you know, the word faqih comes from faquha, which means to understand, to have the correct understanding. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Man yuridillahu bihi khayran yufaqihu fid deen. That whoever Allah wishes or intends good for, 
he gives him the correct understanding of the religion. So uh, the word, uh, the point is that the wording here is yufaqihu. He, he gives him the correct understanding. Faqih comes from faquha, which means to understand. So the job of the muhaddith is uh, to grade the hadith, to tell you whether it's fabricated, to judge between this and that, to uh, to know the biographies of the people, to memorize the isnad. His job was memorizing the matan of the hadith and the chain of narration back to the Prophet ﷺ. This was the job of the muhaddith. The job of the faqih is to take from the muhaddith. The muhaddith said that this hadith is authentic, so because this hadith is authentic, this is how we're going to understand it, in line with the principles that will allow for uh, a non-contradictory understanding of the Quran and Sunnah. So you'll notice that the, the, the four madhabs, the Hanafi, Shafi'i, Maliki, and Hanbali madhabs of fiqh, they don't have contradictions within them. Why? Because they all follow the, a set of principles, a set of principles that's unique to each one that allows for the understanding of some hadith over other hadith and allows for the understanding of hadith to be in line with the Quran. For example, the Quran says, wash over your feet for wudu. But the Prophet ﷺ wiped over his socks. So in the hadith, there, it seems, you know, on the apparent, there's a contradiction there. However, these scholars, you know, in their in part of their principles, they've derived, uh, you know, the way by which we understand the, the, the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, where it's not actually contradicting the Qur'an. Now, all of that being said, this was the job of the faqih. The job of the faqih is to look at all of the verses, to know, you know, the history of when each verse was revealed, to know... Uh, you know, the language of the Arab so that he understands and gets a complete and comprehensive understanding of the Quran and Sunnah. So when we say that the scholars of Islam have agreed on a certain type of aqidah, aqidah is all from the understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah. So when we say the scholars of Islam have under agreed on the understanding of a certain aqidah, we're talking about the scholars who are specialized in that field. Because, and this is no disrespect, this is no disrespect to the muhaddith or the great scholars of hadith of our past. There's no disrespect to them because it's the same as me saying to a, you know, say for example, I have a professor in mathematics and he's a mathematician. He gives his opinion on, bio on biology. He gives his opinion on something and, you know, me being a biologist, I will say that's inaccurate. I, that, that's inaccurate. And I'll tell people, don't listen to him. Don't listen to him when he's telling you about biology because he's not specialized in that field. That's not his specialty. Listen to him when it comes to mathematics. Take from him when it comes to mathematics. Why? Because that's his specialty. So when I tell people that, am I disrespecting the mathematician? I'm not disrespecting him. I'm simply saying that this was not his, you know, maybe there's something that he misunderstood. Maybe there's something that he missed. Maybe he didn't get a comprehensive understanding because this was not his field. He did didn't dedicate his life to specializing in this field. He dedicated his life to specializing in mathematics. Now, now that that is that is you know clear and clarified, when you see the Salafis, you know, trying to prove their positions and say, look, such and such scholars said this. The majority of who they quote is scholars of hadith. They don't quote from scholars of the field. They don't quote from people who are specialized in that field, which is why when I go through this video, inshallah, and we're going to talk about what, what it means to say the majority of the ummah of the Prophet ﷺ is Ash'ari and Maturidi or uh, you know, has followed a specific set of aqidah principles, what it means to say that is that the majority of the scholars who were specialized in the field of understanding the Quran and Sunnah, they have agreed on these principles. And those are the people who we should be taking from. Now, the last point that I want to mention before we get into the actual video, the last point, which is extremely important, is I'm going to give the example first before I clarify. So suppose you are injured and you're in critical condition and you're in a hospital right now, okay? You're in the hospital, you're in you know, the emergency room, you're in critical condition and you're, you, you're about to die. Somehow you have enough time to, and, and you're wealthy enough, to call 20,000 doctors who are all specialized in, uh, you know, in uh, performing surgery, for example, okay? You call all of these doctors and they're all in front of you and every single one of them does an analysis, you know, they, they do a whole, you know, checkup on your body and they say, you have a problem with your liver. And if we don't operate on your liver and give you a transplant, you're going to die, okay? Your liver is going to rupture and it's, it's, you know, you're going to die. So this is what 20,000 doctors who are all specialized in their field are saying that the problem is in your liver. So we need to do a transplant. And then comes one person who's not specialized in the field. And he comes and says, no, the problem is not in your liver. The problem is in your lungs. 
And then you have another person who comes and says, it's not in your lungs, it's in your back. And another person comes and says, it's actually in your heart. And another person says that this, and another person says that. And all these people, a bunch of different people are coming and saying different things. And then suppose you have 30 people. Let's say 30. Let's even say 50. Let's even say 100. 100 people come to you and say, the problem is not in your liver. The problem is in your kidneys, right? So they, you know, 100 people agreed on a different problem. However, you have 20,000 in front of you. And let's, we could even say 50,000 doctors who are, you know, actually specialized in, in their fields. And uh, they're all saying that your problem is in your liver. Who are you going to trust when it's your life at hand, right? When it's your life, when it's a life and death situation, who are you going to trust with your body? You're going to trust the 20,000 and any sane person would trust the 20,000 doctors who are all, you know, top level uh, surgeons and they, they've all studied for so long and they, and they all come to an agreement. Every single one of them performed their own independent analysis on your body and they've all checked you independently and they all said that you have a problem in your liver. You are going to trust them and b the reason why you're going to trust them is because you're in a life and death situation. You're about to die. If you don't listen to one of those opinions, you're going to die. And so you're going to say, my best bet is with all of these super qualified scholars, right? Scholars in medicine, with all of them saying that it's my liver, most likely it is my liver. So we're going to do the liver transplant and you're going to trust them and you're going to go with it. Why? Because this is your life at hand and you don't want to die. Okay, that's your physical life. What about your spiritual life? What about Jannah and Jahannam? What about the afterlife? What about when it comes to your deen and it comes to your religion? Why are you going to reject the majority of the scholars who have independent conclusions and independent minds? And speaking on that, you can see from just one madhab, the Hanafi madhab, for example, Imam Abu Hanifa, Abu Yusuf, Muhammad, and Imam Zufar. You have these, these great scholars within the Hanafi madhab, right? The, some of the top scholars of the early Hanafi madhab, and they all, some, some of them, they all disagreed with each other. They, they were still considered part of, you know, the Hanafi madhab, but they all had their own individual disagreements. Why is that the case? It's because every single scholar had an independent mind of their own. There's no such thing as, you know, a bunch of different scholars adhering to one madhab for only political reasons, okay? This didn't happen. When you're a scholar and you dedicate your life to Islam and you believe something is correct, you stand up for that thing. And this is what the great scholars of the past have done. So anyhow, when you have each and every scholar differing with each other on things that they believe are true, it shows that they had an independent mind. So now what that means is when they differ on each other and all these different things, and then on one thing, they all come to a unanimous agreement, it puts some heavy weight to that thing. That how is it that every single one of them had their own brain, looked at the Quran and Sunnah, understood it, you know, on their, in their own mind, understood it, and they all came to the exact same conclusion, except if that conclusion is correct. This is the exact same way all those doctors performed the independent analysis and they came to that conclusion. So when it comes to your physical life and your, your, your life and death situation, you trust the 20,000 scholars over the few you know, hundred that are, are there you know, presenting different ideas and, and differing opinions saying that it's something else. You'll trust the 20,000 there, but when it comes to the deen, uh, people don't trust the, the majority of the scholars, especially the majority of the scholars who have specialized in the field of understanding the Quran and the Sunnah. So this point has to be extremely clear that the majority of the scholars is, uh, is something that is solid. It holds some serious weight to it uh, when it comes to um, an independent agreement, especially to do with things like Aqidah. Uh, to do with things with belief and especially when it comes from scholars who are specialized in the field and to this i want to mention a few different ahadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and this will be the first the beginning of the first part of the video where i'm going to mention these different ahadith and i'll put them up on the screen over here so let me just make some space for that there we go okay the first hadith here is narrated by abu dhar al ghifari radiyallahu anhu where he says that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said and i'm only going to recite the english because if i recite the arabic and the english it's just going to take double the time for no reason so I'll recite the English. He says, whoever separates from the majority by even a hand span has removed the noose of Islam from around his neck. This is self-explanatory hadith. The noose of Islam is around your neck and when you leave the majority, you remove that noose, right? You remove that noose. In other words, you separate and, and step away from Islam. 
Okay. Another hadith is narrated by Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu where he says that the Prophet wasallam said that verily shaitan is a wolf to mankind like the wolf of a herd. He takes the loner and the one who wanders and goes astray and goes to different uh, goes different ways and differs, right? And he says that uh, beware of branching paths, different, you know, differing uh, sects within Islam. And he says, وَعَلَيْكُمْ بِالْجَمَاعَةِ وَالْعَمَّةِ That hold firm and stick firm to the majority of the scholars. Stick firm to the majority. And I say of the scholars, even though he didn't say of the scholars, because when we say hold firm to the majority, it's not referring to the opinion of the layman. The layman who doesn't know anything, who doesn't know any Arabic, who can't, you know, doesn't have the qualifications to go into the Quran and Sunnah, he's not a scholar, their, their opinion doesn't matter. So, you know, it's not the majority of the people, it's the majority of the scholars who are specialized in the field of understanding the Quran and Sunnah. When they say something and the majority of them say something, hold firm to that because most likely that is what is correct. Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu says, اتبعوا السواد الأعظم Right, a sawad al a'zam is like the main body, the, the the huge group, right? The 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 large group of scholars. He's saying the Prophet is saying, follow this large body, follow this this main body. Um, for indeed, the one who separates from it will be separate in Jahannam, right? Whoever separates from this will be separate in Jahannam. Why is that the case? Because if you have the main body of Muslims who agree on something, and then uh, they, they're all saying that this is the correct aqidah, for example, and they're saying this is the correct understanding of the Quran and Sunnah when it comes to aqidah and what we believe in Islam as Muslims. And then you have someone who separates from that majority and separates from that group. Essentially, he's saying that what you guys all believe is wrong and what I believe is correct. Now, if what the majority believes is correct, then actually what that person believes is incorrect. And the Prophet ﷺ is giving us, a, he's giving us, you know, in these hadith, he's showing us that the, 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 the correct understanding of the Qur'an and Sunnah is going to be preserved through, uh, through the majority of the scholars coming to an agreement. And he says this in this next hadith here, where he says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَجْمَعُ أُمَّتِي أَوْقَالَ أُمَّتْ مُحَمَّدْ صلى الله عليه وسلم. That he says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَجْمَعُ that Allah will not cause my ummah to unanimously agree upon something that is misguidance, ala dalala, upon misguidance. So in other words, he's showing that Allah is in control here, right? Because Allah, Allah took it upon himself to preserve the Qur'an. If that means that Allah took it upon himself to preserve the Qur'an means that he took it upon himself to preserve with it the correct understanding of the Qur'an and Sunnah, then he also took it upon himself to make sure that it gets preserved in a way that the ummah can recognize so that they know truth from falsehood. And the Prophet ﷺ is telling us here in this hadith that Allah will not allow the ummah of the Prophet ﷺ to agree upon something that is incorrect or to agree upon something that is falsehood. And he says, Yadullahi ala al-jama'ah that Allah's support and Allah's uh, you know help and agreement is with the majority of the scholars once again and he says Woman shadda, shadda finnar, that whoever you know separates from this whoever uh you know leaves this 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 majority um is is going to be separate in jahannam this is what he's saying in this hadith and then we have one more hadith over here and this hadith is very important and i'm going to tie this hadith into the end of this video as well inshallah where the prophet sallallahu says innahu sayakunu ba'di hanatun wa hanat that after me there's going to be some you know afflictions and evil you know evil it says here uh, calamities and evil behavior he says faman ra'aytumuhu faraq al jama'ata that whoever you see separating from the majority of the scholars, leaving the majority understanding leaving what the majority of the scholars who are specialized in their field say when you see a person separating or you see someone who's trying to create division amongst the ummah. So you have that main body of Muslims and you see someone who's trying to create division amongst them saying that, oh, you're not, you know, you're not from amongst us and whatnot. You see someone trying to create division or you see someone separating. He says, فَقْتُلُوهُ Right? That, that kill that person. He says, كَائِنًا مَنْ كَانْ Whosoever that person might be, kill him. We're not taking this on its, uh, you know, فَقْتُلُوهُ as in kill him, as in, you know, kill his, him and take his life. That's not what we're taking the understanding as. We're taking the understanding of this as because he's posing a threat in the field of knowledge, kill him with knowledge. Kill him with, uh, you know, the correct understanding. In other words, refute him. 
right? Get rid of these these false ideas that he's presenting. So when when they when they try and make a claim like this, you respond to that claim and 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 disprove it and show that that claim is inaccurate and show that it's wrong, so that the people stick with the majority and they don't end up following him. And that's how you stay safe from this person who's trying to kill you or or you know pose such a huge threat to your religion and your relationship with Allah. And the same wording comes next where he says, فَإِنَّ يَدَ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْجَمَعَةِ That Allah's, Allah's uh, you know, support and his help and whatnot is with the majority of the scholars. He says, فَإِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ مَعَ مَنْ فَارَقَ الْجَمَعَةَ يَرْكُضْ That the shaytan is with the one who, uh, who separates from the majority, he's running with him. Right, so the one who leaves, this is this is the job of shaitan. He wants to create division amongst the ummah because when the ummah is united, the ummah is powerful. But when the ummah is separate, the ummah is weak. And the job of shaitan is to make the ummah weak. So his 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 his, his main job is to make us divided, make the Muslims divided, divide the ummah, and don't let them agree on such and such things. So when you see somebody who, you, you, you see the majority of the scholars agree upon something and you see someone who separates from that, stick to what the majority did and don't follow that because when you're following that, you're actually following the footsteps of shaitan because he only inspired that person to think in that kind of way to separate him from the majority and create that division. So all of that comes from shaitan and the Prophet ﷺ is telling us to be aware of that and stick with the majority and again, the majority of the scholars who are specialized in the field. Now, what does this what does this all tell us this tells us and this these hadith show us that sticking to the majority of the scholars is what's going to be the way to know the correct understanding of the quran and sunnah so what does this require from us we being in the year you know 1400 after the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it requires us to look throughout history that who has this majority been who has a sawad al a'zam bin? Who has the majority of scholars who are specialized in their field, the fuqaha? What have they been saying about the Quran and Sunnah? Where has their understanding and their intellects and their independent minds, where has it been? For 1,400 years, what have they understood from the Quran and Sunnah? And so this requires us to take a look at uh, some, of the, some of the great scholars in the history of Islam. And so for that, I've gathered um, a bunch of different uh, you know, cita- uh, quotes from different books of, of, of the great scholars of the past who are specialized again in, in fiqh. They've specialized in understanding the Quran and the Sunnah. I'm going to start off with some of, the more famous, some of the more famous scholars that almost everybody knows. And so I'll start off with Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullah. Now before I say anything about Imam al-Nawawi, the Salafi sect that we have today that we're talking about right now, they like to attribute Imam Nawawi to themselves. Some of them say that Imam Nawawi was not an Ash'ari, right? He, they say that he was not upon the aqidah of the Ash'ari, uh, the Ash'ari methodology and the Ash'ari, Ash'ari principles. And some of them like to say that he was and he was actually a deviant. But the majority of them say that Imam Nawawi was not Ash'ari, which is incorrect as we're going to show over here from Imam Nawawi's own words. In Imam Nawawi's book, Tahdeeb al-Asma, right? He writes the biography of Imam Abu Ishaq al-Asfarayini, Right? Um, and there's a difference of opinion whether it's Isfarayini or Asfarayini, but our teachers and our shuyukh have said that it is the, the, correct, uh, the correct pronunciation is Al-Asfarayini. So take that as a benefit uh, for whosoever will. He says under the biography of Imam Abu Ishaq Al-Asfarayini that he was one of three who lived during the same time. Kana al-Ustadhu ahada thalathati alladheen ishtama'u fi asrin wahid. That Ustad Abu Ishaq Al-Asfarayini was one of three great scholars who lived at the same time. And he says that they stood together, these three, these three great scholars stood together in defending the aqidah of Ahlus Sunnah. Okay? He, says, he says, defending the methodology of Ahlus Sunnah in theological matters. So specifically talking about aqidah, these three scholars stood together in defending the aqidah of Ahlus Sunnah wal Jama'ah upon the Quran and the Sunnah. And then he says, right afterwards, you know, to elaborate on that, who stood in defense of the madhab of Imam Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari. The methodology of and principles of Imam Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari is what these three scholars stood for. And he names the three scholars as being Abu Ishaq al-Asfarayini and uh, Qadi Abu Bakr al-Baqillani and Abu Bakr ibn Fawraq. Okay, so you have these different, you have these three scholars and these were giants in the Ash'ari creed. In the early Ash'ari creed, these were some of the giants and the legends um, of the the Ash'ari creed. And I want to make it clear that when I say Ash'ari creed, before anyone misunderstands, I'm not talking about just a sect, just as we have the Mu'tazilis and we have the Karami and we have the, uh, uh, you know, the different sects, uh, you know, the Shia, for example. There's different sects within uh, within classical Islam. The, Ash'a, the When I say Ash'ari, 
It's in reference to Ahlus Sunnah. It's in reference to uh, the Aqidah that the Salaf were upon. It's in reference to the Aqidah of, uh, of of the majority of the Ummah and in reference to the Aqidah of Ahlus Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So that's that's what I mean when I say the you know when I talk about the Ash'aris or when I say something about the Ash'ari Madhab. That was Imam Nawawi talking about Abu Ishaq al Asfarayini, and he continues on to praise Abu Ishaq al Asfarayini, saying how how you know wonderful he was in knowledge. He says that he reached the rank of ijtihad, of independent reasoning. Right? He didn't require anyone else's statement. He was capable and qualified to go to the Quran and the Sunnah himself and give the correct understanding because of his immense knowledge and his uh, you know his his deep knowledge of uh, of Arabic language, of fiqh, of uh, aqidah and usul and whatnot. He says he had such such deep knowledge of these things that he was you know he was at that level he was he was very high in his knowledge and this person Abu Ishaq al Asfarayini was an Ash'ari and so were the other two great scholars and Imam, uh, Imam An-Nawi here is essentially praising both of them and uh, sorry all three of them he's praising all three of them as saying that they were followers of the Aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah and he specifically names the Madhab of Imam Abu Hassan al Ash'ari you have uh, another another quote this is from Imam Ibn Kathir Ibn Kathir in his Tabaqat he wrote that uh, Imam an nawawi says, Imam an nawawi says, uh, over here, وَمَتَى أُطْلِقَ فِي كِتَابِ فِي كُتُبِ الْأُصُولِ لِأَصْحَابِنَا Which means that whenever the word Al-Qadi, the, uh, the word Al-Qadi is used in the books of Aqidah from our scholars, right? And he says it's referring to Abu Bakr al baqillani Now Abu Bakr al baqillani was an Ash'ari. And this is Imam Nawawi saying, when you see the word Qadi in the books of Aqidah from our scholars, li ashabina, our scholars. So it shows that Imam and Nawawi had this, uh, you know, he, agreement with the Ash'aris that he was uh, himself. He believed the Ash'ari madhab was the madhab of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And Imam and Nawawi is somebody that we don't even need to mention how great of a scholar he, uh, how great of a scholar he was. You have uh, Imam Al Hakim, Imam Al Hakim, who wrote the Mustadrak. He he's um, uh, you know a great scholar in Hadith of the past. And one of the things that happened with him is that people kind of slandered him for being a Shia, right? They slandered him for having Shia tendencies and whatnot. So over here in this book, Imam Taj al-Din al-Subki in his Tabaqat al-Shafi'iyah, he writes in this book that in, in order to know a scholar and know his aqidah, the first thing that we have to do is look at you know his family, look at his teachers, look who he took knowledge from, who he sat with, who he studied with, etc. Look at these things and we'll be able to find out the aqidah of this person. So he says for Haq- for Al Hakim he says ثم نظرنا uh, ثم نظرنا مشايخه الذين أخذ عنهم العلم that uh, we looked at his scholars and his teachers who he took knowledge from but not only who he sat in the gathering of and you know how a lot of people like to say oh yeah I studied under this person meanwhile they didn't really study under that person they kind of just sat in one of his you know uh, halaqat and they listened to something he said they didn't really study you know one on one with him he says وكانت له بهم خصوصية that he had some type of a personal connection with them. That he had some type of uh, close relationship with, right? He says, and we found them from the leaders of Ahlul Sunnah. And who are these people? From the core figures of the Aqidah of Imam Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari. The Ash'ari Madhab once again. And these are, uh, he names them, and one of them is the exact same name that we just spoke about before that Imam al we spoke about, which is Abu Bakr ibn Furak. So Abu Bakr ibn Furak was, again, a hardcore, uh, top-level you know, Ash'ari scholar for, for, from the Ash'ari Madhab. And over here he's saying that Imam al-Hakim had a close relationship with him. And he studied and took knowledge from him one-on-one directly. He had a close, now tell me, Imam Abu Bakr ibn Furak, would he have a student like this if that student, right, and that close of a relationship with him, if that student differed with him in Aqidah and was considered a Mubtadi'. Because if you differ in Aqidah, you're considered a deviant, right? And you're not upon the path of the, the, the Quran and Sunnah. So if you have a differing opinion, you know, if, if, if a scholar, a great scholar had a differing opinion to his student, in something as important as Aqidah, he wouldn't have kept that close relationship with. We have, you know, different statements of uh, some of the great scholars and their teachers, you know, they, the great scholars, they would sit in the gathering of the teacher and the teacher would say, get out, because their teacher differ, differed with them on something. And the, t- the teacher would not sit with them and have that personal relationship if it was a difference on an issue that had uh, you know so, you know a lot of weight to it, such as an issue in Aqidah. So he's saying over here that Imam al-Hakim, had a close relationship with these Ash'ari scholars, these core figures of the Ash'ari madhab. And he says, uh, That these are the people who he used to sit and study with. 
These are the people who used to, he used to, uh, you know, study with. And he says, ma'ahum fi usul diyanat that he used to speak with them in aqidah, in aqidah matters. Okay, usul diyanat is aqidah matters. He says he used to speak with these scholars, and this is who he used to have aqidah discussions with. He used to study and learn aqidah from these scholars. These were his teachers. So this is Imam Al Hakim rahimahullah. You have Imam Al Bayhaqi. Imam Al Bayhaqi. All the way from the year 458 is when he passes away. He says, uh, he, he, he begins by praising Imam Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari and talks about all of his you know, virtues and his knowledge and his lineage and his, his, uh, his uh, piety and whatnot. And then he says that, uh, you know, he praises him for the, major- for, for the huge amount of following that he has from the Shafi'is and the Hanafis and the Malikis. He says, وَكَثْرَةُ الْأَصْحَابِ مِنَ الْحَنَفِيَّةِ وَالْمَالِكِيَّةِ وَالشَّافِعِيَّةِ the, the, the huge amount of, of scholars who follow him from the Hanafis and the Malikis of Shafi'is, those who, uh, you know, liked and preferred to delve into aqidah, fi ilm al-usul. And this is something that also you'll see in, the, in some of the old books, that when they say um, ilm al-usul, they refer, that means aqidah, and ilm al-furu'ah, is referring to fiqh. So usul means aqidah and furu' means fiqh in some of the old books. Next we have Imam Ibn Kathir rahimahullah. Now there is no you know direct thing where he says that I'm Ashari or something like this. And you know some of his statements in his books may be problematic to the uh, Ash'ari madhab. However, he acknowledges and recognizes the Ash'ari madhab as being the madhab of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah. He says in his book, this is in his book at Tabaqat, he says as for the methodology of Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari in the attributes of Allah. In other words, in Aqidah. As for the methodology of Imam Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari, he says after he repented from the Mu'tazila school, because it's known that Imam Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari used to be a Mu'tazili, and then he repented and came back to Ahl sunnah and refuted the Mu'tazila. Um, he says after he came back, to, uh, came to Baghdad and took from the scholars of Hadith, such as Zakariya Saji and others, he says then it is from the most authentic paths and madhabs. From the min asahi, what does it say? Fahuwa min asahi turuqi wal madhab. Fainaha min asahi turuqi wal madhab. That it is one of the best and most authentic and you know closest, essentially closest to the Quran and Sunnah, you know methodologies in aqidah that we have. He says, as he affirmed the intellectual and textual based attributes of Allah, and he did not reject any of them, nor did he accept modality for them. And this is something that we're going to talk about in, in future videos, inshallah, talking about the modality and, uh, you know, when it relates to aqidah, we'll talk about that. He says that he did not accept modality for them, and this is the path of the salaf. And this is where he says, he says, وَهَذِهِ طَرِيقَةُ السَّلَفِ وَالْأَئِمَّةِ مِنْ أَهْلِ السُنَّةِ وَالْجَمَاعَةِ That this is the path of the salaf al-salih and the scholars of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah after the Salaf. Okay, so the path of the Salaf and the scholars of Ahl Sunnah after the Salaf was the Ash'ari Madhab. The Ash'ari Madhab was the was uh, you know the creed of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. This is Imam Ibn Kathir rahimahullah who who directly praises the Ash'ari Madhab. Now over here you will see some of the Salafis will like to say that okay, hold on a second. Imam Ibn Kathir mentions three stages for Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari. Number one, he was a Mu'tazili. Number two, he came to Ahl sunnah but he fell into interpretation. And number three, he left interpretation. And they say that when Imam Ibn Kathir is praising the Ash'ari madhab here, he's praising the madhab, uh, you know, the last part where he rejected interpretation as well. That's not true. Why? Because of the statement of Imam Ibn Kathir right after he ends off this paragraph. He says, وَعَلَى هَذَا الْمِنْوَالِ جَرَى الْأَئِمَّةُ مِنْ أَصْحَابِ الْأَشْعَرِي That upon this methodology, upon his, upon Imam Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari, his methodology upon the tariqah of the Salaf, upon the understanding of the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah after the Salaf, upon this methodology did the scholars who came after Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari, the scholars who were his companions, did they follow? These scholars who were his companions, and he mentions in there, Qadi Abu Bakr al-Baqillani, who is the same name as, uh, you know, the same one that Imam al we spoke about, who, sat, who, who was, you know, one of three, who, who was with Imam Abu, uh, Abu Bakr ibn Furak, and Abu Ishaq al-Asfarayini. These scholars were from the, you know, they were hardcore Ash'ari, Ash'ari scholars. He says that, uh, he says that this is the same methodology that those Ash'ari scholars who helped codify the madhab and the methodology 
of um, the Ash'ari creed, these scholars followed that same methodology that Imam Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari was upon. And these scholars accepted interpretation, no problem. These scholars accepted interpretation. And this is something that we'll talk about in many other videos in the future, inshallah. We'll talk about the, the, the details of interpretation, why you know some scholars said you're not allowed to interpret and whatnot. We can get into that when we're talking about uh, aqidah in depth. We have over here Imam Ibn Kathir rahimahullah, another sort of indication that he had, you know, he agreed with the Ash'ari Aqidah. He writes in his tabaqat over here, he's giving the um, biography of this Shafi'i scholar. He says that he used to be affected by the Mu'tazila school of thought in Aqidah. He used to be a Mu'tazili. Okay. And then he says, ثُمَّ فَتَحَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ That Allah, you know, honored him. Right. Allah opened his heart. Allah honored him and showed him the correct way. And he says, فَرَجَعَ إِلَى مَذْهَبِ أَهْلِ السُنَّةِ وَالْجَمَعَةِ That he returned to the madhab of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'a. What does that mean? Imam Ibn Kathir, right? What we understand from this is that Imam Ibn Kathir is saying that this scholar came back to Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'a. He titles this Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'a. And then he quotes Ibn al-Jawzi. Ibn al-Jawzi was an Ash'ari. Okay? And he, Ibn al-Jawzi says, وَكَانَ رُجُوعُهُ that this scholar's return to Ahlul Sunnah, his repentance to Ahlul Sunnah as well. So notice how both of them, and this is how we understand these statements of the scholars of the past, that notice how both of them are acknowledging that he came back to the madhab of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Now why would Ibn al-Jawzi say that he came to the madhab of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah if he didn't come to the Ash'ari madhab? If he didn't agree with the principles of the Ash'ari madhab, why would he acknowledge that he repented and came to Ahlul Sunnah if Ibn al Jawzi didn't believe that anything besides that was Ahlul Sunnah? Right? So it shows that this scholar, when he supposedly repented, in, in other words, his aqidah came in line with the Ash'ari madhab. His aqidah came in line with Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And this is what Ibn al Jawzi is saying. And Imam Ibn Kathir acknowledged that in the previous paragraph. So this is more indications of Imam Ibn Kathir. Rahimahullah. Now we'll get into some of the uh, other scholars uh, throughout history. Imam Tajuddin al Subki, rahimahullah, he says, Al Maliki, I'm going to only recite the English for the same reason that I mentioned before. He says the Malikis are the most exclusive of all the people, of all of the you know scholars. The Malikis are the most exclusive to the Ash'ari Madhab. Why is that the case? Right? He says, إِذْ لَا نَحْفَظُ مَالِكِيًا غَيْرَ أَشْعَرِ And here I am reciting the Arabic again. He says, because we don't know of any Maliki, and he says, as we don't know of any Maliki that is not Ash'ari. The Malikis are all Ash'ari. Now, one thing I'm going to make very clear is Imam Tajuddin al Subki, some of the scholars of the past, right, they would have, you know, a, a sort of, they would use ibarat, which means like different wordings and, and terminologies, and they'd use them loosely. Okay? So when Imam Tajuddin al Subki titles a bunch of people Ash'ari, it means in agreement with the Ash'ari principles. And this is something that will be clarified by his own words later on in the video. At the end of, at the end of these screenshots, Imam Tajuddin al Subki clarifies this. However, for everyone, to know right now when he says that they are Ash'ari it means that they agree even if they don't title themselves Ash'ari when you look at their Aqidah they're in agreement with the, the Ash'ari Madhab which is the, in agreement with the Madhab of the Salaf al-Salih and the understanding of the Salaf and the Quran and the Sunnah so he says we don't know of any Maliki إِذْ لَا نَحْفَظُ مَالِكِي and what does that mean? we don't know of any Maliki because Imam Tajuddin al-Subki was a historian and he was a biographer and his book is written uh, of, of the biography of a bunch of different scholars and so he says every time we, I come across a Maliki scholar every time I see they're always Ash'ari or they always you know I look at their Aqidah and I write down whether they're part from Ahlul Sunnah or they're not and I have to look at their Aqidah when I look at their Aqidah they're in line with the Ash'ari Madhab they're all Ash'ari right so he's saying that the Malikiyah they're the ones who are most you know exclusive to the Ash'ari Madhab and there are others from different Madhabs who have fell into you know a different sect such as the Mu'tazila sect or Ila Tashbih which means the sect of the Mushabbiha which are those who liken Allah to his uh, who likened Allah to his creation. He says there are people from the different madhabs who have fell into that, but the Malikis, they've been safe from that. So what is this showing us? It's showing us that the majority of the Malikis, and this is Imam Tajuddin al-Subki from the year 770. So from, from, from the beginning, all the way till 770, everyone who attributed themselves to the Maliki madhab in, 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 in their understanding of the Quran and Sunnah, that you know when the scholars, when they looked at the Quran and Sunnah and they came to a conclusion, they found that their conclusion is in line with the principles that Imam Malik had already put down. And they said, we agree with Imam Malik's principles of how to understand the Quran and Sunnah. So they called themselves Malikis. He's saying that every single one of them, for this many hundred years, has been Ash'ari. 
or has agreed with the Ash'ari principles. So it shows uh, you know, a good majority there. Imam Ibn Hajr al-Haytami, rahimahullah, he says, what is meant by sunnah, and this is coming way later, showing, what I'm trying to show here, is that for so many years, hundreds of years, the majority of the scholars and Ahlul Sunnah has been the Ash'aris and the Maturidis. It hasn't been anything else. It's been the Ash'ari school and the Maturidi school. And we say Ash'ari and Maturidi as titles, but they are both in agreement with each other in what is uh, in the principles of Aqidah, which we're going to get into uh, right at the end of this, this section, inshallah. Ibn Hajr al-Haytami says, what is meant by the term Sunnah? Right? What is meant by Ahlul Sunnah uh, is, is the Aqidah that the two Imams of Ahlul Sunnah were upon, Shaykh Abu Hassan al-Ashari and Abu, Su- Abu Mansur al-Maturidi. And he says, and Bid'ah, innovation, is what the groups of innovators who deviated from the Aqidah of these two Imams and all of their followers. Notice how he mentions all of their followers because the Aqidah is not made up of two people and it's like we're following these two people instead of the Quran and Sunnah. This is not what that means. What it means is these two people you know, the, the, the madhab, the methodology, the school of thought is named after these two people and it's agreed upon by the thousands of scholars who came after them. They all had, again, again, I mentioned before that they all had independent minds. They all came to certain conclusions and when they found that their conclusions agreed with the principles of this scholar, they say, okay, he was the pioneer of this of these principles. He kind of put these all together like this. And so when their, when their understandings and conclusions agreed with them, then they titled themselves Ash'ari. And it's an attribution to, to that Imam. And that Imam followed the Qur'an and the Sunnah and gave the correct understanding of the Qur'an and Sunnah. And it wasn't just him, it's all the thousands of scholars who agreed on that understanding as well. So it still fits in line with the, the majority of the scholars who specialized in the field. This was uh, this was the, the majority understanding. And I just wanted to make that clear that when he says that, uh, you know, talking and saying that it's the aqidah of the two imams it's not the aqidah of just these two imams he also mentions and all of their uh, and all of their followers this is imam izzuddin ibn abd salam he says uh, he he mentions that the shafi'iyah the maliki the hanafiyah and what's called fudala ul hanabila the fudala the virtuous or the honorable the virtuous of the hanbalis were ash'ari right now again ash'ari over here means the the uh, you know there's there's uh, a little bit of loose usage of the word Ash'ari here. It means whoever agrees with the principles of Imam Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari in Aqidah. And this is going to become clear later on, but I'm just reiterating that so that um, you know there's no confusion. This is uh, this is what he says, that the Shafi'is, the Malikis, the Hanf- Han- Hanafis, and the, uh, the virtuous of the Hanbalis. The virtuous of the Hanbalis. Why? Because a, a, a lot of the Hanbali scholars fell into the you know mistake of likening Allah to His creation, and this is um, you know the mistake of the Hanbali. So he says that the ones who didn't fall into likening Allah to His creation and they didn't fall into that mistake, they're considered the virtuous of the. Hanbalis. So he puts them with. He, he kind of separates between the two and says that they all agreed. All of these people agreed with the principles of Imam Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari. What he's trying to show is that the majority of the scholars from the Hanafis, the Shafi'is, and the Malikis and some of the scholars of the Hanbalis to show that the Hanbalis don't have their own Aqidah. It's not like if you're Hanbali, you have your own Aqidah or if you know, you're Hanbali, you have to differ. He's, show, he's showing that you can be Hanbali in fiqh and have the Aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah as well. You can have the Aqidah of the Ash'aris and the Maturidis. This is, uh, you know, he's showing the majority of the scholars essentially um, have this agreement. The same thing with Imam Ibn Hajib, uh, who was considered the Shaykh al-Malikiyah, the leader of the Malikis. And the one we just mentioned was the Shaykh al-Shafi'iyah of his time, the leader of the Shafi'is. And this was in the year 500, the year 600, and the leader of the Hanafis over here um, in the year 600 as well. You have uh, uh, Imam Abdul Karim Ibn al-Hawzan al-Qushayri, from the year 400. And he said, the scholars of hadith in his time, the scholars of hadith have agreed that Ima, that Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari was one of the leaders of the scholars of hadith. And his madhab in aqidah, right? His, uh, his aqidah madhab is the madhab or aqidah of the hadith scholars. That he's showing that in, uh, in, the, in the year 400, the majority of the hadith scholars have agreed that his madhab represents the hadith and the Quran the best. The Quran and hadith is what it means, ashab al-hadith, right? That, um, you know, the, the scholars of hadith, the people of hadith, his madhab is in agreement with with the Quran and Sunnah. This is what this muhaddith is saying here. And this is from the year 400. You have Abu Ishaq al-Shirazi. He says, Verily the Ash'ari, the Ash'ariya, right? The, uh, the, the Ash'ari madhab are the leaders of Ahlul Sunnah and the defenders of the Sharia, right? So totally praising the Ash'ari madhab all the way from early on 
and it goes you know all the way on we'll, we'll get to a little bit later reports uh, in a bit he says and the defenders of sharia so whoever tries to you know throw uh, you know blame to them or dispraise them or curse them out or refute them is trying to refute Ahl Sunnah, is trying to throw blame upon Ahl Sunnah, is trying to, uh, you know, smear the name of Ahl Sunnah. That's that's for whoever is trying to smear the name of the Ash'aris, is trying to smear the name of, uh, of Ahl Sunnah. This is also Abu Ishaq al-Shirazi as well. He says, uh, he's talking about, He's talking about Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari, the leader of Ahl sunnah and he says, وَعَمَّةُ أَصْحَابِ الشَّافِعِي عَلَى مَذْهَبِهِ That the majority of the scholars of the Shafi'i Madhab are upon his methodology in Aqidah. Why? Because the Shafi'i scholars agreed with his principles. They they were they were Shafi'i scholars of Fuqaha. This is why why is he mentioning why are the scholars and this this ties into what I said at the beginning. Why are the scholars mentioning titles of fiqh? Why are they mentioning titles of fiqh? Saying that the fuqaha, because it's the fuqaha that matter. It's their understanding of the Quran and Sunnah that we have to take. It's it's them who we look to because they had the 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 capability to understand the Quran and Sunnah in the correct and most authentic way. So he says that the majority of the scholars of the Shafi'i Madhab, they're all upon his Madhab. Uh, they're all upon the Madhab of Abu Hassan al Ash'ari, and he says, وَمَثَبُهُ مَثَبُ أَهْلِ الْحَقِّ that his Madhab is is the his his methodology is the methodology of the truth. So. Again, you know, throughout throughout all of this, I'm trying to show that throughout the history of Islam, these scholars who are specialized in the field of understanding the Quran and the Sunnah have all agreed upon. The majority of them have held the agreement that the Quran and Sunnah is to be understood upon the principles that uh, that are in line with the principles of the Ash'ari Madhab, right? And we'll get to some of those principles uh, in a few, inshallah. And then we have from sort of recent times this was just before muhammad ibn abdul wahab you know and his and his whole da'wah you know started spreading and everything this is al murtada al zabidi from the year 1205 and he says when the term ahlus sunnah is used it refers to the ash'aris and the maturidis this is showing that for that long throughout the history of islam when you see ahlus sunnah anywhere in the any, anywhere in the past scholars books you see ahlus sunnah it refers to ash'aris and maturidis okay this is what the uh, this is what the scholars are saying all the way up until just recently and he quotes from a book uh, that was written by a scholar from the year 800 so you have from 800 to 1200 and this book over here he says they ahlus sunnah are the ash'aris they in reference to the ahlus sunnah because it's a commentary of a shorter book and in this commentary he comments on the statement of Ahlus Sunnati wal Jama'ah, and he says, Wahum al Ashairah, that they are the Ashaira, Wahada hu al Mashhuru, that this is what is well known in the lands of uh, Khurasan, in Iraq, in Syria, and in most other lands. That in, in most of the lands, the Fuqaha, the scholars, right, they are Ashaira, they are Ashari, that this is what Ahlus Sunnah is, that you know. Some you know somebody wants to try and criticize Ahl Sunnah. It's like, well, this is what Islam has been. The scholars of Islam. This is what we have, uh, uh, you know, as Islam. So saying that, oh, they weren't from. Uh, you're just trying to kick out, you know, the history of Islam. This is our history. This is who the scholars were. So, anyways, this is what he's saying that in these lands, the Ashaira are the more popular ones. And then he says, Wafi diari ma wara an nahar. Talking about like uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Pakistan, these these areas, he's saying that um, Ahlus Sunnah is the Maturidis. They are considered Ahlus Sunnah over there, and we'll get to it again towards the end that the Ash'aris and the Maturidis are one and the same. They they differ on very few things, but their principles are the same, and that's what we're talking about when we use the word Ash'ari and we use the word Maturidi. It's the principles that are behind these madhabs. And then we have Abu Abbas al Hanafi, and he says that the majority of the scholars of uh, the Shafi'i Madhab took from the Madhab of Abu Hassan al Ash'ari, and the Shafi'is wrote many books based upon the Madhab of Abu Hassan al Ash'ari, right? And he says uh, some of our companions, because Abu uh, Abu Abbas al Hanafi was a Hanafi scholar, and he says that some of our scholars. We, we took from Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari as well, but we believed that Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari was wrong in a few different matters. And he mentions like, for example, a taqween, which is something that is different between the Ash'aris and the Maturidis. They have this differing opinion. But like I said before, their principles are the same. And this is what keeps them within Ahl Sunnah. So we'll get to just now, um, you know, why are we still, why is the Ash'aris and the Maturidis and, uh, you know, uh, the Ahl al-Hadith, why are they considered part of Ahl Sunnah, it's because their principles and their, you know, their usul 
is in agreement with each other and their usul is no different even if they differ on uh, other matters that are you know uh, minor minor issues we have al izz ibn abd salam and he says the shafi'is the maliki's the hanafi's and some hanbalis i wrote over here on this translation explained in the video which is what i explained before about what fudala al hanabila refers to the the virtuous of the hanbalis saying that it refers to those hanbalis who didn't fall into likening allah to his creation he says that they agreed they agreed on following the aqidah of abu hasan al ashari and then you have Abdullah al-Muwahibi al-Hanbali who was a Hanbali scholar to again show that the Hanbali scholars also held this opinion that the Hanbali scholars also believed the Ash'aris were upon Ahlus Sunnati wal Jama'ah. This is something that is shown by you know the, the, the Salafi sect that we're trying to make this whole video about and show um, that they're inconsistent with the history of Islam. They're inconsistent with the understanding of the scholars. They're inconsistent with the understanding of the Salaf. What we're trying to show is that they will commonly say that we are reviving the Hanbali Madhab, that we are followers of the Hanbali Madhab. And you'll always see uh, Imam Ahmed said this, and Imam Ahmed said that, and they try and quote Imam Ahmed as if they are Hanbalis. However, if you look at just before Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab came, the Hanbali scholars considered the Ash'aris and the Maturidis as part of Ahl Sunnah. So he says in this book, you know, this is from the year 1000, only 400 years ago, which is only 200 years before Ab ibn Abdul Wahab came and, and started spreading his ideas. He says over here that uh, the, the groups of Ahlus Sunnah are three. You have the Ash'aris, the Hanbalis, and the Maturidis. Why did he say the Hanbalis and he didn't uh, you know, you know, uh, add them to the Ash'aris as well? It's because he's being literal with his ibara. He's being uh, you know, literal with his usage of the word Ash'ari. That the Ash'aris are one, the Maturidis are one. Notice how before they said that the Hanafis were also Ash'ari. He didn't, he didn't mean the Hanafis were Ash'ari. He meant the Hanafis were Maturidi. But he uses the word Ash'ari because they agreed with the Ash'ari principles. The same thing over here. Uh, sorry, not the same thing over here. Where the Hanbali is, is using the literal term Ash'ari and Maturidiyya and Hanabila. Saying that each of them have their own. They, they, you know, they differ with each other on certain things. However, he says Tawaif Ahlus Sunnati Wal Jama'ah. That Ahlus Sunnah as a whole includes these three. Because these three all agree on the principles okay imam ahmad ad dardir from the year 1200 who we memorize his poem al kharida al bahiya he says the imams of this ummah who came after the salaf whom it is wajib on us to follow they split into three categories number 1 the uh, the group of scholars who specialized in fiqh the ones who specialized in aqida and the ones who specialized in tazkiya tazkiya to nafs right? purification of the heart okay and so as for fiqh he says that we follow the four madhabs as for Aqidah, he says we follow Imam Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari or Imam Abu Mansur al-Maturidi. And he's saying that this is, uh, notice the, the uh, clarification that he made where he says um, they exhausted themselves in the field of Aqidah that the Salaf were upon. Because for the history, this is from the year 1200, for the history of all of you know Islam basically, the Ummah has agreed, the scholars who are specialized in the field of understanding the Quran and Sunnah have agreed that the correct understanding of the Quran and Sunnah is in line with the Ash'ari and the Maturidi Aqidah. There's nothing wrong with that, right? And all of it is in line with following the Salaf al-Salih and following the Quran and the Sunnah. This is Imam uh, Ahmad al-Dardir. Then we have Imam al-Safarini al-Hanbali, who was another Hanbali scholar. Again, showing that the Hanbalis before Ibn Abdul Wahhab and the Salafi movement, where they try and you know kick everyone out of Ahlul Sunnah saying the Ash'aris are not part of it, the Maturidis are not part of it, only, uh, only these people are part of Ahlul Sunnah, etc., this is showing that the Hanbali scholars themselves have agreed that the Ash'aris and the Maturidis were from Ahlus Sunnah. He says in his book, Ahlus Sunnati wal Jama'ah is three groups. He says al Athariya, and their Imam is Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. He's talking about the, the Hanbalis essentially. The same thing that the, the other scholar Al-Muwahibi said, that he said there's Ash'aris, the Hanbalis and the Maturidis. Same thing over here, he's saying that you have the, the uh, Hanbalis, the Atharis. Um, and their imam is Imam Ahmed ibn Hamal and this is not to get confused with the Salafis of today because they say that they are the Atharis and they say that they are the followers of Imam Ahmed ibn Hamal. however they came after uh, after Imam al-Safarini al-Hanbali so when Imam al-Safarini al-Hanbali is uh, saying Atharia and quoting and following the uh, Imam Ahmed ibn Hamal, he's not referring to them because it would be fine to call them Atharis if they agreed with the principles that the Atharis agreed upon. And these principles we're going to get to, uh, I believe it's actually the next the next slide. Yes, it's the next one, inshallah. So, to finish off this, this statement here, Hanbali scholars saying and acknowledging that the Ash'aris and the Maturidis were from Ahl-Sunnah. 
In this last slide here, Imam Tajuddin al-Subki rahimahullah says, know that Ahlul Sunnah has agreed on one aqidah in terms of what is necessary, permissible and impossible for Allah. Even if they differed on the methodology used to come to that conclusion. So he's saying, he's explaining that the Ash'ari and Maturidi and Hanbali madhabs, right? The Ash'ari and Maturidi and Hanbali madhabs, they're just a, a term that's used to explain how we derived such and such conclusions, right? But the conclusions are the same and that's what makes them Ahlul Sunnah. That's why he says that Ahlul Sunnah has agreed upon these principles. What are these principles? What is wajib for Allah? What is muhal for Allah? And what is ja'iz for Allah? These are the three things that all of Ahlul Sunnah has agreed upon. So for example, the Mu'tazila school will say that it's necessary for Allah to do what is best for his servant. It's, it's wajib for Allah. It's, it's, it's mandatory for Allah to do what is best for his servant. Ahlul Sunnah said no. Whether you're Ash'ari or Maturidi or Athari, we said no. And so that's why we agree on this. And the Mu'tazila, they're not from Ahlul Sunnah because they differed on something that is that they claim is wajib for Allah. Same thing when it comes to something that is permissible for Allah. Ahlul Sunnah says that it is, it is generally possible for Allah to create and to not create. If He wants to create, He can create. If He doesn't want to create, He doesn't have to create. The Mu'tazila you know, another sect, they said that it's wajib, necessary, mandatory for Allah to create a prophet to send to us, to teach us uh, the way of guidance so that we can be saved in the next life. He said, they say it's mandatory for Allah to send a prophet, which means it's mandatory for him to create a prophet. So where Ahlus Sunnah agreed that this is something that is equally permissible for Allah to do or not to do. Allah can choose to do it, He can choose not to do it. If He wanted to, He didn't have to send any prophets. Nobody's there to tell Allah what to do. This is the, the opinion of Ahlus Sunnah wal Jama'ah. However, the Mu'tazila school rejected that and they said it's mandatory for Allah to send uh, to create and send prophets. Um, an example of something that is impossible for Allah is the example that Allah is uh, you know, a physical object or Allah is within a time and a place. Allah being a physical um, a physical God or, you know, a God made up of physical properties and whatnot, this is something that Ahlul Sunnah has always rejected. That, And you'll see this in, in the next part of this video, you'll see this where the, the even the Hanbalis have agreed that the idea that Allah is made up of, you know, is a body or a physical body or a physical entity, this idea has to be rejected firmly in one's heart. And you cannot believe that Allah is something physical. This is, you know, this has been the aqidah of the Ash'aris, the Maturidis, and the Hanbalis. However, those who differ are the ones who step outside of Ahlus Sunnah because these are our principles. This is Ahlus Sunnah's principles and they've all agreed upon this one aqidah and when you separate from that, you then separate from Ahlus Sunnah. And so an example of this is the Mushabbiha. The Mushabbiha, very simple. They used to say that Allah, uh, you know, Allah has a literal hand and Allah has literal body parts and actual, you know, literal body parts. What do we know as a body part? What does anyone know as a body part? Everyone knows that a hand is a physical body part. Everyone knows that an eye is a physical body part. And so when they say Allah has a literal eye, it's attributing that physical body part to Allah. And that's something that goes against all of what Ahlul Sunnah has ever said. Okay, so this is, uh, I wanted to use this slide to clarify Imam Tajuddin al-Subki's usage. When he uses the word Ash'ari loosely, he's referring to anyone who's Ahlul Sunnah, refers, refers to this group of uh, people, these this group of scholars who have held th an agreement in their belief about Allah and uh, what is mandatory, impossible, and possible for Allah. Now, what this shows us, <coughs> what this shows us is the statement of the Prophet ﷺ in the first hadith that I mentioned that he says, when you see a group of people trying to separate from the majority or create division amongst the majority, then that's the person you should be aware of. You be aware of that person. Why? Because he's the one who's posing a danger and a threat to your religion. Whether you recognize it or not, doesn't matter. He's the one who's posing a serious threat to your religion. And so you stay away from him. What do we see from the Salafi sect of today? Right? We see, we already saw right now that the Prophet told us that, the, that Islam has been preserved and will be preserved through the majority of the scholars' understanding of Islam. I've already explained that we look at the majority of the scholars who had the specialty of understanding the Quran and Sunnah. And then we looked at the history and we showed that the Malikis and the Shafi'is and the Hanafis and 
Some of the Hanbalis themselves were all in agreement with the principles of the Ash'ari Madhab and the Maturidi Madhab and the Athari Madhab. When, you know, the principles that were there that we just spoke about, those principles were all agreed upon by all of the scholars who came throughout our history. So now when you see someone who comes and tries to say that they were wrong, they're either separating from that majority, right? You have the majority of the scholars and they're either separating from it, in which case you stay away from him, or they're trying to stay within it, which is what the Salafis are trying to do. They're trying to stay within that majority who's considered Ahlul Sunnah by saying that we're Athari and we're, we follow Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal when they don't. And we're going to show that now. But they're trying to say that we stay with the majority, but they're creating division amongst them. Why? Because you'll see that the, the Salafis will say the Ash'aris are not part of Ahlul Sunnah. The Maturidis are not part of Ahlul Sunnah. So they're creating division amongst the majority, about amongst th what Islam has been. What Ahlul Sunnah has been, it has been the Ash'aris and the Maturidis. And you know the minority has been the Atharis. But these people came today and they're trying to create that division amongst the Ummah. Whereas we're all supposed to agree on the principles of Aqidah, which is... Um, which is where the which is where it shows that the Salafis of today are actually not followers of Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. They claim to be just like they claim consensus on so many things that the scholars have agreed upon this and the scholars agree. They say so many things and there's going to be you know many videos in the future inshallah showing all of these things that they'll say you know so much they'll say so much and none of it will be backed none of it will be backed by uh, by the actual uh, scholarly opinion. So all that being said, all that being said. This next part of the video is where I'm going to talk about and show one of the leaders of the Salafi sect that we have today. His name is Ibn Uthaymeen. And I'm going to compare his statements with some of the scholars of the Hanbali school. So I'm not even going to look at the Ash'aris. I'm not even going to look at the Maturidis because they won't accept it anyway. They think that he, you know they're, they're not part of Ahlul Sunnah. And because they, they think that, they're not going to accept if I was to mention the Ash'ari position. So forget that. Let's take something that they say that they accept. They accept the Hanbali school of thought. They say that they're Hanbali and they follow Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal's Aqidah and they follow this and that. Okay, we're going to take Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal's Aqidah and compare and contrast the two and show how they are inconsistent in their uh, in their methodology and their understanding with the scholars of the past. Over here we have Imam Abdullah al-Mawahibi al-Hanbali, where he, this is a scholar that I mentioned before in the previous section of this video, he says in his Aqidah book, and he's quoting the Hanbali Aqidah, by the way. He's not quoting Ash'ari or Maturidi or any other Aqidah, he's quoting the Hanbali Aqidah. All the way in the year 1000, just before the, the Salafi movement began, this is what the Hanbali Aqidah has been. And he's quoting from the Hanbali saying, فَمَا نِعْتَقَدَ أَوْ قَالَ Whoever believes in his heart or even says with his tongue, إِنَّ اللَّهَ بِذَاتِهِ فِي مَكَانٍ فَكَافِرٍ That whoever says with his tongue or believes in his heart that Allah is in any place بِذَاتِهِ With his essence. Notice that word بِذَاتِهِ فَكَافِرٍ That that person is a disbeliever. Let's look at what Ibn Uthaymin says. Right? Ibn Uthaymin says, and this is again what the, the Salafis are very famous for, making up things and saying that and attributing it to Ahl Sunnah. He says over here, the madhab and the position of Ahl Sunnah is that Allah rose with his essence. Allah in his essence is above the throne. Ala bidatihi. There's the key word again. Ala bidatihi. He rose above the throne with his essence. So we know or we, we, we see over here that it's been the Hanbali Aqidah and the Ash'ari and the Maturidi Aqidah. It's been the Aqidah that we say Allah is not in any place. Allah does not take up space. Allah is not physical. These are things that the Aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah has been. And the Salafis came back and said that lied against the Ahlul Sunnah. It's, it's not the position of Ahlul Sunnah. Ahlul Sunnah has been what I just quoted. right? And I've, I've given my proof for it. I've showed so, much, so many examples of the scholars agreeing on this. He says that Allah rose above the throne with his essence. Allah is above the throne with his essence. Bidatihi. Number two, you have Qadi Abu Ya'la al-Hanbali. Abu Ya'la was a Hanbali scholar from the year 458. Okay, 458. He wrote a very detailed work on Aqidah, on the Hanbali Aqidah. It's called Al-Mu'tamadu fi Usul al-Din. And in this book, he says that Allah is not in a direction. Kama jazat ru'yatuhu la fi jiha. Right? Allah is not in a direction or in a place, right? Because if, you, if you're not in a direction, you're not in a place. And if you are in a direction, you're in a place. These two things are, uh, they go hand in hand. So anyhow, he's saying that Allah is not in a direction. Allah is not there 
or there or there or there. Allah is not in a direction. Okay, clear? Ibn Uthaymeen says, إِنَّ نَفْيَكُمْ لِلْجِهَةِ يَسْتَلْزِمُ نَفْيَ الرَّبِّ عَزَّ وَجَلْ That your negation of a direction for Allah is actually a negation of Allah Himself. So he's saying that Abu Ya'la, the Hanbali scholars, and the Ash'aris and the Maturidis all negated Allah's existence because they all said Allah is not in a direction. He says over here, إِذْ لَا نَعْلَمُ شَيْئًا لَا يَكُونُ فَوْقَ الْعَالَمُ وَلَا تَحْتَهُ وَلَا يَمِينُ وَلَا شِمَالُ he says that because we don't know of anything, we don't know of anything that's neither above or below or on the right or on the left, right? He's saying that he's completely drawing an analogy between what he's seen around him and Allah. Thinking, and this is what the idea of the mushabbiha are, they liken Allah to his creation. They think that Allah works the same way as his creation. When you think that way, you come to these conclusions. However, Ahlul Sunnah has not thought this way. Allah said, Laysa kamithlihi shayt means he is different to all of his creation. There is nothing similar to him. You cannot draw analogies between creation and say that we only have seen. We've only seen things around us that are on our left or in a direction. Yet because everything you see around you is physical. Everything you see around you is physical and Allah is not physical, so he's not in a direction. He created places. He is not within a place. So there's no direction that we can literally point to Allah and we don't understand the how of that because we only know what we see and we only know and uh, we only see physical things. So anyhow, Ibn Uthaymeen over here says that if you negate a direction for Allah, you're actually negating Allah's actual existence. However, the Hanbalis, the Ash'aris and the Maturidis negated a direction for Allah. The next thing we have over here is Imam Abdullah Al-Muwahibi Al-Hanbali, the same Hanbali scholar. He mentions in his book that it is mandatory to hold firm that Allah is not a physical being. We believe that Allah is not physical. What does Ibn Uthaymeen say? He says, if it is, if it is mandatory or if it is something that is necessary from us to be able to see Allah, that he is uh, a physical body, then let him be a physical body. There's no jazm, right? The the uh, the Hanbali scholar said that it's mandatory for you to hold firm to the belief that Allah is not a jism. Allah is not physical. He's saying, well, لَيْسَ فِي الْكِتَابِ وَالسُنَّةِ إِثْبَاتُهُ وَلَا نَفْيُهُ In other words, it could be, it could not be. So he's allowing for the possibility of Allah to be physical, Whereas the Hanbali and the Ash'ari and the Maturi, the Aqidah has stated throughout history that it is mandatory to hold firm that Allah is not physical. And then we have uh, Imam Abdullah al-Muwahibi al-Hanbali over here saying that it is mandatory to hold firm uh, to the belief that Allah is separate from his creation. He existed without place. He created place. He existed before the creation of place, etc. He says that he is not analogized with people, right? Analogies are not drawn between people and the creation and Allah. He says he does not resemble anything and nothing resembles him. Look at Ibn Uthaymeen over here. He says, he brings the hadith that Allah, uh, that the Prophet ﷺ said, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ خَلَقَ آدَمْ عَلَى سُورَتِهِ And he says this, this suratihi, this his image, refers to Allah and doesn't refer to the person as uh, you know a good number of scholars have said that it refers to that person. But anyways, he says that that means Allah, Allah has an image. And what is this image of Allah? Well, this image of Allah is what he created Adam alayhi salam upon. So then he says, well, if somebody was to ask that, okay, what is that image that Allah has? What is the image that Allah has that he created humans upon? Ibn Uthaymin says, well, Allah has, uh, humans have eyes and Allah has eyes and Allah has a face and we have a face and Allah has hands and we have hands. So he draws the analogy between our body parts. This is this is likening Allah to his creation 1000%. Anyways, then he says, فَهُنَاكَ شَيْءٌ مِّنَ الشَّبَهِ لَكِنَّهُ لَيْسَ عَلَى سَبِيلِ الْمُمَاثَلَةِ He says, فَهُنَاكَ شَيْءٌ مِّنَ الشَّبَهِ That there is a type of similarity between Allah and his creation. شَيْءٌ مِّنَ الشَّبَهِ There's a little, there's, there is that similarity there. That Allah has a hand and we have a hand. There's that similarity there. However, if you look at what the Hanbali scholars have said, and the Ash'aris and the Maturidis once again, all of the Aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah from the past, they've said, لَا يُشْبِهُ شَيْءًا وَلَا يُشْبِهُهُ شَيْءٌ That Allah doesn't resemble anything and nothing resembles Allah. There is no shabah. There is no resemblance at all whatsoever between Allah and His creation. So he says over here, Ibn Uthaymin says, that فَهُنَاكَ شَيْءٌ مِنَ الشَّبَهِ لَكِنَّهُ لَيْسَ عَلَى سَبِيلِ الْمُمَاثَلَةِ Which means that there is a similarity, but it's not, you know, complete similarity. Mumathala, like, you know, 
uh, an exact an exact replica type of thing. Um, Abu Fadl al Tamimi over here. Look what he says over here. He says that Imam Ahmad's aqidah was when Allah says, "Wa wajhu rabbika," the face of your Lord will remain. He says the meaning of waj over here, the of face. Laysa ma'na waj ma'na jism indahu, right? That the meaning of face is not a physical face, according to Imam Ahmad, right? And the Hanbali Aqidah as a whole. The face is not a meaning of a physical uh, body part, right? Nor is it surah. Pay attention to this word. Wala suratin, right? It's not in the meaning of an image, nor is it in the meaning of a physical body, body part. And then what does he say? وَمَنْ قَالَ ذَلِكَ فَقَدِ ابْتَدَعْ And whoever says that, whoever says that, and, 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 and attributes the face as a surah or as an image to Allah or for Allah, whoever says that, فَقَدِ ابْتَدَعْ has innovated, has deviated. Okay? Ibn Uthaymeen says, If you ask, what is the image that Allah has that Adam was created upon? The image. What is the image that Allah has? We respond by saying that Allah has a face. In other words, what? His face is an image. And the Hanbali scholars, Imam Ahmed, Imam Abu al-Fadl, the Hanbali scholars of the past have said that if you say that the face of Allah, the meaning of it is an image, you have innovated, you have deviated. فَقَدِ ابْتَدَعْ Qadi Abu Ya'la, rahmahullah, he says in his book, that um, Allah, Allah says uh, the, the verse بَلْ يَدَاهُ مَبْسُوطَتَانِ Now this verse is, is so profound and we're gonna, I'm going to have a whole different video that just explains this verse. Anyhow, this verse, Allah says بَلْ يَدَاهُ مَبْسُوطَتَانِ That Allah's hands are outspread. What does that mean? right? So some scholars like the Hanbalis over here says that it means we establish Allah has an attribute of Allah has an attribute of, that are called yad that are called hand, right? The translation would be hand, but the meaning is not a hand. He says over here, وَلَيْسَتْ بِجَارِحَتَيْنِ That Allah's two hands, these these two hands, are not body parts. Okay, so what are they then? Because the only thing you know of what a hand is, is body parts. But he's negating that it's a body part. He's saying it's not a body part. So what is it? This is proof that it's not taking the hands on the literal meaning. So he says, وَلَيْسَتْ بِجَارِحَتَيْنِ That it's not uh, two limbs, uh, or body parts and then he negates the metaphorical meanings as well because he didn't believe that they were taken as a metaphor he said they were they were to be believed in as attributes of Allah rather than um, descriptions of you know some type of a physical body type of thing so anyhow uh, Imam Abu Fadl al-Tamimi and he says that uh, he quotes Imam Ahmad وكان يقول, he says that Imam Ahmad used to say verily Allah has two hands and he says that they are attributes of his essence and they're not body parts they're not physical etc and then he says uh, that uh, you don't you don't draw analogies to Allah's hands. That Allah's hands are you know something else. This yad for Allah, and we just mentioned before that they're not body parts. So this is a complete negation of the actual literal meaning of the word's hand of the word hands, um, because the literal meaning of the word hand is a body part. That's what it is. And if you don't negate the literal meaning of the word hand, then you believe that you're attributing a literal body part to Allah, whether you say it or not. It's like saying that um, it's like saying uh, I bought a bike. But then, and then somebody says, oh, so you bought a bike that has two wheels. And you're like, well, no, I didn't buy a bike that has two wheels. I bought a bike. It's like a, two wheels are part of a bike. It comes with that statement. You say you bought a bike, you mean you bought two wheels, right? And, and a seat and whatnot. So when they say that Allah has a literal hand, it means a body part. And if you don't negate a body part, or if you don't negate the literal meaning, then you're affirming something uh, such as a physical body part. Uh, to Allah. Ibn Uthaymeen over here says, he comments under the exact same verse that Imam Abu Ya'la commented. Remember that one where Allah says, rather his two hands are outspread. بَلْ يَدَاهُمَ بِسُوطَةً Right? He says, يَقُولُونَ Again, trying to quote from Ahlus Sunnah. Make, this is what they do. They, they'll always say, oh yeah, Ahlus Sunnah wal Jama'ah says this. Ahlus Sunnah says that. And they're just making something up. Because I'm showing you what Ahlus Sunnah wal Jama'ah says. And I'm showing you what all the Ash'aris and the Maturidis and, the Han and these Hanbalis that I'm quoting. And these are not Hanbalis that were Ash'ari. These are Hanbalis upon the madhab of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. I'm showing you what they said. And I'm showing you what this guy said. And, and they're, they're completely different. So anyhow, what does he say over here? He says, يَقُولُونَ أَهْلُ السُنَّةِ wal Jama'ah says, هِيَ يَدٌ حَقِيقِيَّةٌ ثَابِتَةٌ لِلَّهِ That it is a literal hand established for Allah. A literal hand established for Allah. 
Over here, Abu Ya'la al-Hanbali, the same scholar from the past, he in his book, Al-Mu'tamad fi Usul al-Din, he says, um, the Prophet ﷺ described Allah with uh, nuzul, right? With uh, with descent descent and ascent, right? But he says, لا على وجه الانتقال والحركة That not by way of movement from place to place, right? In other words, in other words, not a literal movement, not a literal coming and a literal going, and a literal descension and a literal ascension. These are not literal terms. This is what he's trying to say that the Hanbali Aqidah was, the Ashari Aqidah was, and the Maturidi Aqidah was. All of us agree on this on, on this topic. But I'm bringing the Hanbalis. Anyways, Ibn Uthaymin, what does he say over here? He says, فَنُؤْمِنُ بِأَنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْتِي حَقِيقَةً We believe that Allah comes literally. Allah literally comes. This is what he's saying. This one we have Imam Ibn Uthaymin. He says that, it, uh, you know, it's come to us before because he wrote about it before. He says that Allah's ascension is of two types. The attribute the attribute of ascension and the literal ascension where he says, that, that Allah's, you know, Allah's actual essence is what rises. And so there's that literal kind of ascension, which is movement from place to place and something that the Hanbalis have rejected. Ibn Uthaymin says over here, what the, he lies about the Mathab of Ahl Sunnah, and I brought this screenshot from before, it's the same one, but it explains this this point as well, where he says that uh, the Mathab of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah is that Allah rose with his essence. Allah rose literally with his essence. That uh, you know, and this is this is movement from place to place. If you move with your essence, you're moving from one place to another place, and this is something that's rejected by the Hanbalis, uh, the the classical Hanbalis, and all of the Ashari's and Maturidis. And the last thing I have here is some screenshots of uh, Qadi Abu Ya'la, where he you know indulges in kalam and he uses kalam arguments to prove and disprove things in his book of. Aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah of the Hanbali Madhab. And this is the reason why I'm mentioning this is because the Salafis of today, they're always trying to attack, you know, Ilm al Kalam and they think that they know what they're talking about. Really, it goes against them because their own scholars from you know that they claim to follow, they claim to be Hanbali uh, and follow the Hanbali Madhab. The, their own scholars from the Hanbali Madhab went into Kalam and used Kalam in their own works. If you look at this, for example, if I, I'm going to read this right now. If there's any Salafis watching this, tell me if you understood this, right? I'll be shocked if they understood because these are, this is, you know, they have to sit, they'll actually have to sit there and read, okay, hold on, what did it say? And read it like 10 times over just to get such a simple thing that it's not, it's not simple to them because they don't, this is not something that they learn. This is not something that they know, right? And so they give the ruling on this without knowing anything about it. Right, <clears throat> so I'm gonna read this one here. He says, "Wala yajuzu an yuqala inna kull wahid min huma shart lil akhir, li anna thalik yujib kawn kull wahid min huma muhtaj ila al akhir, wa thalik yujib kawn al shayi muhtaj ila nafsihi, li anhu ida kan muhtaj ila ma huwa muhtaj ilayhi sar li thalik muhtaj ila nafsihi, wa thalik muhalun." So. Tell me who understood that. I'll tell you what it's talking about. I'll give you I'll give you the answer. It's talking about circular reasoning and the impossibility <clears throat> the impossibility of two things being interdependent um, on each other. So anyhow. And then, and then I have one more screenshot that I wanted to mention. This, this from Imam uh, Ibn Qudama. Ibn Qudama was a, you know, a great scholar in the Hanbali school, and he's someone that is respected, well respected by, uh, by you know, the all of the Hanbalis, right? Now the Salafi sect they act like they love Ibn Qudama because of how respected he was. They disagree with everything that's in Ibn Qudama's book, right? With regards to Ibn Qudama was a mufawid. And we'll get to that in when we talk about aqidah itself. But, uh, you know, they disagree with it. This is what Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal says according to his book, Lum'atul I'tiqad. He says this is, uh, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal says that uh, the hadith about Allah, uh, Allah uh, the hadith about Allah descending to the first heaven, and the uh, hadith that says Allah will be seen on the day of judgment. These, you know, these are hadith that seem to indicate that Allah is a physical body. Imam Ahmed says that نؤمن biha, <clears throat> we believe in it. And you know, we affirm it. Bila kafin wala ma'na, without a modality and without a meaning. We don't give a meaning to this, to these, to these uh, words, and we don't have a modality to these words. This is what Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal says. And remember what I said at the very, very beginning of this video, where I spoke about how, when the Salaf say something, whose understanding of their words are we taking? So the what I'm going to say right now is what the majority of the fuqaha have said, who who are all you know in 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 agreement in their aqidah. They've said that the word when the word when you see the word bila kaif. It's a complete negation of modality. The Salafis of today have come and they've said that bila kayf actually means bi ithbat al kayf. 
that when the Salaf said no modality, they meant yes modality. But we don't know the knowledge of that modality. They say that that's what the Salaf meant. Whereas the rest of the scholars have said that the meaning of no modality is no modality. Why? Because modality is to explain how of something, the, the how of something, the state of being in which something is in. The, the how of something is, uh, you know, only asked about to describe a physical object or a physical being, right? How tall is he? How big is he? How heavy is he? How short is he? How th These are all questions to be asked to physical and about physical beings, right? They're not asked about for Allah. Allah is not physical, so therefore he has no modality. And this is what the Salaf is saying over here. So when he says bila kayf, he means bila kayf. And this is what the majority of all of the scholars from all the madhabs and those who specialized in the field of aqidah have said. Bila kayf means bila kayf. No modality means no modality, right? And wala ma'nan because this is tafwid, and we will get into that in a uh, in a future video. And but the 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 simple explanation is wala ma'nan without a meaning because if we were to say what does hand mean, you would say body part. Okay, what does hand mean if you're saying it's not a body part, right? Remember Ahmed, Imam Ahmed and the Hanbalis, they all said that Allah's hand is a hand, but it's not a body part. Okay, what in the world is it? Right? And this, you ask the Salafis this, oh, it's understood from the language. Okay, what is it? What is the hand? Right? You ask them what is the only definition we can give to a literal hand is a physical body part. That's what we know of as a hand. The people who were people and came up with words for language, when they came up with these words, they saw a hand and they said, we're going to call this yad. So the only thing that we know of as a yad is this literal physical hand. And if you negate that Allah has a literal hand, you say he doesn't have any, he doesn't have a, uh, a physical hand, then what do you say the hand means? Well, we don't know what it means. Allah knows what it means. Anyhow, this is Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal saying these two. And I just gave you the meaning of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal's statement that the ummah has agreed upon and the majority of the scholars have all agreed upon from those who are specialized in understanding the speech of the Quran and the Sunnah. And if they can understand the speech of the Quran and the Sunnah, they can understand the speech of the scholars as well. And I just gave you that understanding, which is contradictory to the understanding that the Salafis and the Wahhabis of today uh, say when they say no modality actually means yes modality, but no knowledge of the modality and they interpret it like that. And no meaning actually means yes meaning, but no additional meaning or no changing of the meaning you read that in the commentaries I actually read a commentary of Imam Ibn Qudama's book anyhow this is Imam Ahmed Ibn Hanbal Imam al-Shafi'i said a similar thing he says Amantu billahi wa bima ja'a anillahi ala muradillah that I believe in Allah and what has come in terms of you know attributes and what has come about Allah upon the meaning that Allah intended why is he saying upon the meaning that Allah intended instead of upon the literal? The Salafis don't say that. They say upon the literal meaning. Ala zahirihi. He's saying ala muradillah. On whatever Allah intended. And this is, this is tafweed. This is, you know, leaving the meaning to Allah. The, you know, I believe in whatever came, came from Allah upon the meaning that Allah intended. Okay? This is Imam al-Shafi'i. You have even even uh, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani where he says that uh, he, he talks about the Salafi sect and he says that fi nuzul, that the scholars have differed with the meaning of descent Allah's descent into uh, Allah's descent to the lowest heaven he says that some of them understood this statement this mean, this word of descent to mean uh, on its literal and uh, on its apparent and its literal he says ala zahirihi wa haqiqatihi وَهُمُ الْمُشَبِّهَ تَعَالَ اللَّهُ عَنْ قَوْلِهِمْ That they are the, they are, you know, the, um, those who likened Allah to His creation. They are the ones who have said that we take the meaning on its literal and its apparent. And those who likened Allah to His creation, the mushabbiha, this sect, they were not from Ahl sunnah Ahl sunnah has been uh, different. This is Imam Ibn Hajr al-Asqalani, who's, uh, you know, one of the, uh, who's arguably has one of the greatest commentaries on Sahih al-Bukhari, Fath al-Bari, right? So this is him saying that. And then he quotes the, um, he quotes the aqidah of, of Ahl sunnah of the Salaf al-Salih, and he says, وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ أَجْرَاهُ عَلَى مَا ورد. In other words, they left it as it is. Allah said, يَدُ اللَّهِ فَوْقَ أَيْدِيهِمْ They didn't talk about it, they didn't explain it, they didn't interpret it, they didn't do anything. They said, آمَنْتُ بِمَا جَاءَ عَنِ اللَّهِ That I believe in whatever comes about Allah. And that's it. مُؤْمِنًا بِهِ عَلَى طَرِيقِ الْإِجْمَالِ As a whole, in general, they, agree, they, they believed in them as a whole. 
right? They didn't delve into it saying, oh, he has this and that and that and, and make it different parts and talk about the details of it. And this. They didn't get into any of that. They just said, we believe it. Allah said it, we believe it. That's it. But then there's one condition to that. Munazihan Allah Ta'ala anil kayfiyati wa tashbih. Whilst negating modality and likeness of Allah to His creation. Negating modality. Negating modality. And He says, Wahum jumhurus salaf. That this was the path of the majority of the salaf. And Imam al Bayhaqi and others narrated this from the four Imams. That this condition, you'll see a lot of the times the Salafis will say, Look, Imam Shafi'i said that Allah is above His throne. No, Imam al-Shafi'i didn't say Allah is above his throne unconditionally like that, right? The scholars didn't just say that Allah is above his throne unconditionally. They said that Allah is above his throne because Allah said he's above his throne, but not by way of literal place and literalism that we understand from this because we don't we can't understand that. We can't there's no modality to it. We negate this type of you know, there there being some type of a how to Allah. We negate any type of likeness of Allah to his creation, and this is something the Salafis don't accept. They don't accept that we negate any type of likeness to Allah, and they don't accept that we negate the how. And this was the principle that Imam ibn Hajr al Asqalani is talking about from of the aqidah of the Salaf and um he laid out these, this principle that we negate what does not befit Allah in, in these two these two things, the modality and the and the uh, likeness of Allah to his creation. He laid out the principle and in both of those things the Salafis go against. And I have you know there's plenty of examples of that which I will in future videos there, there will, it will come uh, where they, they go against the modality thing. they establish a modality and they're very explicit about it. Yes, there is a modality. Yes, there is. They don't negate that for Allah. They negate our knowledge of the modality. Anyhow, we'll get into that in, in future video, inshallah. And this one is Imam Ibn Hajr al-Asqalani where he says that uh, he, he talks about the, the attributes of the eyes and the face and the hands and these attributes of Allah. And he says the differing opinions on uh, on how we understand them. And he mentions the third one, which is the uh, the path of the Salaf. He says, Imraruha ala ma ja'at, which means to leave it as it is. Leave it as it is. In other words, the Quran said it, so I believe it and that's it. However, however, I believe in what the Quran said. Does that mean I understand everything the Quran said? Allah said Alif Lam Mim. Do you know what that means? No, you don't. So He says Mufawwidan Ma'naha Ilallah, leaving the meaning to Allah. This is a refutation to the Salafis when they say that when the the scholars of the past used to leave it to Allah, because Tafwil is to leave it to Allah. They say, what are they leaving to Allah? We said, and the majority of the scholars, and you know, all the scholars of the the four madhabs have said that. It means to leave the meaning to Allah. Because if I said hand, and I tell you it's not a physical body part, then you don't know what the hand means. And you don't know what it means. And the same thing with eye, the same thing with face, the same thing with, you don't know what it means. So we leave the meaning to Allah. However, the Salafis say, no, they established the meaning. In other words, they believed it was a body part. How big was it? What size was it? How heavy was it? What did it look like? That's all what they said we leave to Allah. And they said, we leave the modality to Allah. We leave the knowledge of how to Allah. That's what they, they that's what they claim. However, Imam Ibn Hajr rahimahullah, and along with the rest of the scholars have said that we leave the meaning to Allah. And this is the same thing that Imam Ibn Qudama, who was a Hanbali scholar and the, one of the most respected Hanbali scholars as well, this is also what he said. When he said, Bila kaifin wala ma'na. Without a modality and without a meaning. Because we leave the meaning to Allah. We don't know the meaning, right? Anyhow. And then I just wanted to talk a little bit in general about Ibn Uthaymin over here. There's a statement in his book where he says that those who do tafweed, what I just mentioned right now, leaving the meaning to Allah, he says that uh, they're not able to refute people who claim bad things about Allah. So if somebody makes a, a, a lie against Allah or something and they say something bad, we're not going to be able to refute that person because we say, oh, we don't know the meaning. So if you say you don't know the meaning, then you can't refute this. You know, it could be possible that there's this bad meaning as well. This is what he's saying. This is a complete misunderstanding of what tafweed is. Tafweed is to leave the meaning to Allah whilst negating, whilst negating tashbih, likeness to Allah, and negating uh, kayfiya, a modality. So you, when you negate these two things, then there's nothing bad that you can kind of attribute to 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 uh, those attributes like that. So you negate any type of deficiency for Allah whilst affirming the 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 wording that came in the Quran, and you don't talk about what it means and you don't talk about anything like that. So that's what tafwid really is. But he's claiming that tafwid is something completely different. 
that I don't know. I don't know who does this. Who who does this stuff weird where that he's claiming in this book where you just don't know and you don't negate anything anything deficient from Allah. If there's something you know deficient, we negate it. If there's something that contradicts the Quran and Sunnah, we negate it. So this idea is unheard of, and he's just you know claiming that. Uh, you know, people just say that. And then he brings the statement where some of the scholars have said the path of the Salaf is safer and the path of those who came after the Salaf is more, you know, wise. And he says that uh, Ibn Taymiyyah responds to this statement. He says, <laughs> That some idiots said this. Referring to the great scholars of the past who have said this statement. And it's only because they don't know. And then Ibn Uthaymin has his little commentary there where he says, وَهُوَ صَحِيحُ أَنَّ الْقَائِلَ غَبِيٌّ That yeah, Ibn Taymiyyah is right. That the one who says that is an idiot. Like, anyways, it comes from their misunderstanding of why that statement exists to begin with. Why is it more wise to follow interpretation later on, whereas it's safer to stay away from interpreting such and such verses uh, of the Qur'an or attributes or whatnot earlier on. Why is that the case? During the time of the Salaf, it was easier for them to just believe it and close their eyes to it and that's it. When the, the people later on came and you had to translate the Qur'an into different languages, what happens if I translate the word hand, the word yad, into the word hand? It makes a person who speaks English think Allah has a hand, a literal hand. And you tell him a non-literal hand and he's thinking, well, what the heck is a non-literal hand? What's a non-literal hand? And he can't figure it out, right? What's a non And it makes the person confused that, oh, these Muslims believe in a God that has a face, a hand, a this, a that, a shin. Um, he has all these things, but none of them are literal. So then what in the world does it mean? And there, it gets them confused. So why is it wiser to interpret? Because as the generations left and went farther away from the Prophet ﷺ, people became more incapable of understanding these deeper sort of attributes of Allah. And so because it became less and less common for the layperson to be knowledgeable enough to understand these types of things and to understand what uh, you know the difference between an attribute is and a body part and why the attribute, uh, why the attribute, you know, things like basically all the details to do with aqidah, the layperson doesn't go into it. So to save the layperson from believing that Allah is a physical body, the person who just picks up the Quran and starts reading a translation, a layperson, he doesn't, he don't, he, he's, he's sitting in the masjid and he just wants to read the translation of Allah's word. And he reads the book and he sees that Allah has a hand and he starts to think Allah has a literal hand. To save him from this wrong aqidah and this wrong uh, belief, we go to interpretation, which is permissible. And we're going to get to that in a different video. It's totally permissible to do uh, to do um, interpretation when there's a need. Um, anyways, so to save him from falling into tashbih of Allah with his creation, he says that the path of those who came later of interpreting is more wise. Why is it wise? To save the people. But it's safer still to avoid that if you're somebody who's capable. That's why as the time of the Salaf, closer to the time of the Salaf, they were, you know, they were closer to the religion, they had more knowledge, they had more understanding, etc. Those people were able to understand. So anyhow, the one who said this statement is not an idiot. And he's actually a very wise person who said this. So anyhow, that was that. And then he mentions over here that uh, Ash'aris and Maturidis are not considered from Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. This is what Ibn Uthaymin is saying. Remember what I said about the hadith before where they try to create division amongst what Ahl Sunnah is. And all the way up until Ibn Abdul Wahab's time, uh, when, you know, when I showed you those quotes before, that it, when the term Ahl Sunnah is used, it's referring to the Ash'aris and the Maturidis. This was what Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah is. Right? And Ibn Uthaymin is saying, no, Ash'aris, Maturidis, they're not part of Ahl Sunnah. Why? Because he lies about the Salaf. He says that the Salaf and the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba, they all used to believe in uh, and affirm the attributes of Allah ala haqiqatiha, on its literal. Remember what Imam Ibn Hajar rahimahullah said? Those who uh, you know, take things on its literal and apparent. Those are the people who, you know, the, and the, the Mushabiha, they claim, they claim to follow the Quran and Sunnah better than everyone else. They say, look, we're following the literal of the Quran. The Quran said it. The Quran said it, ya akhi, the Quran said it. This is why they're a replica of, of, of that same sect from before. There's no difference to them. Anyhow, he says, ala haqiqatiha. We take it on its literal. Okay? And then he says, wa lihada yukhti'u man yaqul. 
That he says, for this reason, the one who says that Ahlul Sunnah al Jama'a is three, the Ash'aris, the Maturidis, and the, uh, the, ha- the Hanbalis, the Salafis, right? Whoever says that is mistaken. He says, This is a mistake, this is wrong. Right? The Ash'aris are not part of Ahlul Sunnah, this is what he's saying. Whereas even the Hanbalis considered the Ash'aris part of Ahlul Sunnah before the movement of Ibn Abdul Wahhab, before this Salafi, new Salafi movement, and before uh, you know they started saying things like we take it on its literal and Allah is literally in a place, statements that are you know that, that lead to um, you know bid'ah, saying that Allah has a face and it's an image, etc., these types of things. So this is some of the inconsistencies of the Salafi madhab of the Salafis of today, the Salafi sect. What I've done in this video, what I've done in this video, and I'm going to try and recap it a little bit before I close this off. What I've done in this video is I started off by explaining the importance of understanding the Quran and Sunnah from the Salaf and how we take it from the Salaf, but then how we understand the statements of the Salaf. And that's where the difference between us and the Salafis is. Where Ahlul Sunnah stands and where the Salafi sect stands. How do we understand the statements of the Salaf? I mentioned the importance of taking knowledge from those who are specialized in the field. And then I mentioned different ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ, where he talks about the majority of the scholars and their agreement, showing that this is you know, one of the ways he says, Inna Allah la yajma'u ummati, that Allah will not cause my ummah to unite and agree upon something. Especially because the great scholars of the past all had independent minds and they thought for themselves and they didn't just agree with each other just because so-and-so said so. They all thought for themselves and they differed. So when they did agree, it shows that this thing must be, that every one of them independently analyzed the Quran and Sunnah and they agreed upon this thing. And then because of the importance of the agreement of the scholars in the, the field of Aqidah and you know, in, in, from, from the scholars who are specialized in the understanding of the Quran and Sunnah, from that we went into the history because we're in the year 1400. We went to the history of all of the scholars of the past who are specialized in that field, the scholars of fiqh, the, the jurisprudence scholars, right? We went to those scholars and we saw from all four madhabs that the majority of them were the Ash'aris and the Maturidis. We're in line with the Ash'aris and the Maturidis in their Aqidah. What does in line with them mean and in line with their principles? It means that they agreed in what is possible, impossible and necessary for Allah Azza wa Jal. And then we went into what the Aqidah of the Hanbalis say because we said that the, the Salafis of today, they like to claim that they follow the Hanbali sect and they follow the Hanbali uh, fiqh and the Hanbali Aqidah. This is what they claim. So we took from the Hanbali Aqidah and then we took from the Aqidah of the Salafis and we used Ibn Uthaymeen for that and we used different sources for the Hanbali Aqidah and we compared and contrasted between the two and showed that there is a complete inconsistency to where some of the early Hanbalis declared Ibn Uthaymeen indirectly as a kafir and a mubtadir by saying that Allah is literally in a place, by saying that Allah's face is an image and that it's a literal and actual face and saying uh, these different things that Allah literally comes and whatnot. And we went through that in detail. And then we spoke a little bit about the idea of taf- tafweel and, and, and leaving the meanings to Allah. Uh, and then we spoke about uh, Ibn Uthaymeen where he, he talks about uh, you know, the Ash'aris and makes things up against, uh, against Ahlul Sunnah or about Ahlul Sunnah. And I said that this is something that is common within the Salafi sect that you'll commonly see. That you know, a, lot of, a lot of you guys who, who uh, you know, have heard and read things online from the Salafis, you'll see from them that they say, the majority of the scholars say X, Y, Z and it's a lie. Wallahi, it's a lie. They say, the majority of the scholars have agreed upon X, Y, and Z. He says it right over here that, look, I was just reading this one, that the, the, the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah and the Prophet and the Sahaba, everyone agreed that we take it on its haqiqah. This is not true. There's no evidence for it. And, and I've showed the opposite of that. And I'm going to continue to show it, inshallah, in future videos. So all of this is seen all of this is seen as inconsistencies between the Salafi sect of today and the uh, the the of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah for the past 1,400 years. And I gave the example before, and I'm going to give it briefly once more. That if you are in critical condition in a hospital and your life is on the line, trust the 20,000 doctors who are specialized in their field of medicine to operate on your liver. What I mean by that is because you are not a scholar qualified to go to the Qur'an and Sunnah yourself, and myself included, because we are not scholars of that level, we trust the 
50,000 scholars over the past 1,400 years who have agreed upon something. And we don't trust the little uh, ones that come, come here and there. So when you see the Salafi sect trying to take you away from the take you away from the majority do what the prophet ﷺ said he said faqtuluhu he said kill him and i'm not talking about literally i'm talking about metaphorically in other words learn your deen so that you can kill him in your mind in other words so he, that he does not affect you so that person those doubts that they're spreading this salafi sect that only attacks and 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 targets converts to islam because they know that the convert knows nothing about the deen the convert just became muslim he doesn't know much so they attack him those are the and and, and the people who are you know, really young and they're enthusiastic about their religion. These are the people that go towards Salafism because they don't know much. Because they don't know much. So learn your deen from proper sources. Go sit with the scholars uh, overseas. Go study, you know, with, you know, with traditional proper sources, one-on-one -on -one with the teacher. Study properly. And, uh, you know, if you're not able to do that, then, uh, you know, Stay away from, this is the advice and this is what this entire video is about. Stay away from the Salafi sect in Aqidah. Stay away from the Salafis uh, in, their, in their mindsets. There's going to be so many more videos talking about their, their, their mindset in, in you know, extremism and these types of things that people don't know about. There's so much, there's so much there that people have no idea about. Right. This video is to show, uh, talk about their claim to be with, uh, in accordance with the Quran, the Sunnah, and the Salaf, and we've shown that they are not in accordance with the Quran, nor the Sunnah, nor the Salaf, upon the understanding of all of the ulama for the past one thousand four hundred years.